Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for Chapter 8, Photosynthesis. Um, as always, we begin with a picture. So this is a picture of my backyard. And I picked this picture um, to point out something that I think is hopefully very obvious to you. And that is that, you know, Earth, Earth is really, really green. Like, you go outside nature and, like, there's just, there's a lot of green. Um, this picture, there's some honeysuckle in the background. This is a row of blackberries. Um, I didn't plant these, though guy who owned the house before we did and planted these. Um, there's a nice magnolia tree, some grass. But um, what you're seeing is just a ton of chlorophyll, right? Which is obviously what gives most plants their, their green color. So, you know, this chapter is very important. We're gonna get into some details in photosynthesis in a minute, but first it's just worth, you know, pointing out to you what the process actually does. And, you know, like you hear in the news, Tesla, car company, Elon Musk, they've come out with um, big batteries to help store, you know, Tesla is great, or solar panels are great because they produce electricity, but they don't produce electricity at night. So, you know, the question is, how, how can I store the electricity generated by solar panels? And there's all kinds of cool technologies to help you store the energy. Uh, well, nature for, you know, billions of years has provided a system that stores the sun's energy, and it stores the sun's energy in the molecule of glucose which is a very high energy molecule, breaking down glucose, as we saw back in chapter seven, um, it gives us lots of ATP. So, you know, we, we try and find new ways of storing the sun's energy, but nature has provided one for us, at least for, for biological systems, not really electronic systems, um, but to store the sun's energy in, in glucose. So just some quick definitions, autotrophs, heterotrophs, this is likely not new. Autotrophs are organisms also called producers. They're ones that can build organic molecules, namely glucose. What they need as a fuel source would be carbon dioxide. They need some water. They need sun, sunlight. They also need uh, chloroplasts and other inorganic molecules, um, trace amounts to build um, glucose. Heterotrophs are the consumers of the biosphere. Those are things that um, cannot make their own food, namely glucose again. They're things that have to eat. So, you know, the last line on the slide, producers feed the world. If it weren't for producers, there'd be no link between the sun and organic molecules and life on Earth would, would you know, very, be very difficult to have life on Earth without producers. Um, just some pictures, you know, things that do photosynthesis, plants, obviously, multicellular algae in the ocean. Um, here's some unicellular algae, different eukaryotic cells. Um, cyanobacteria are bacteria, they don't have nuclei, so they're bacteria, but they do have chloroplasts. So they're kind of like a, an asterisk in our, in our classification system. They're, you know, they're prokaryotic because they don't have nuclei, but they do have one organelle, which is uh, chloroplasts. They don't quite fit in our classification scheme, so we had to give them an extra little category. Um, okay, so chlorophyll. So if you look at the uh, uh, cross-section of the anatomy of a leaf, so a leaf has this tissue called mesophyll. And mesophyll, meso means middle, phyll refers to plant. Um, it's the middle portion of a leaf and it's sort of the spongy tissue that has lots of air pockets, which makes sense because um, the cell needs carbon dioxide to make the glucose and it needs oxygen or needs to get rid of the oxygen that it's producing in photosynthesis. So the nice air-filled spongy pocket to the mesophyll helps store those gases. We've already discussed stomata. Stomata are the pore-like structures in leaves that allow um, air to come in and out. Um, also, we discussed transpiration. Um, we've already done chapter 29, so transpiration was important. The cell can open and close its stomata using guard cells. Um, and you know, chloroplast, chloroplast, because the mesophyll is where you have air, that's where chloroplasts are usually found because they need the, the carbon dioxide to make glucose. Um, we've already gone through the structure of a chloroplast. We did this in chapter four, I believe, but just to review. So they're sort of an oval-shaped organelle. You have these stacks, look kind of like stacks of Oreos. The stacks are called granum. Um, granum is the singular, grana is the plural. Um, the stacks are full of membranes called thylakoid membranes. And the thylakoid membranes are where the chloroplasts actually are. I'm sorry, it's, it's where the chlorophyll actually is. The whole thing is a chloroplast. The chlorophyll is are in, are in uh, the chlorophyll pigments are in the thylakoid membranes. Um, the fluid surrounding the, the thylakoids, the grana, is called the stroma. 
Kids always get stroma and stomata confused. Stomata were the pores. There's no R in stomata. Um, stroma is the fluid that surrounds the thylakoids. Every year I have kids in an essay who write about things called stromata. Like stromata is not a word, at least not a word that I know of. It's stroma or it's stomata. There's no stromata. I had one kid one year that called it the stigmata and that, that you know, that, that, that's a word, but that's not something involved in photosynthesis. Um, here's just a, just a different picture showing the cross-section of a leaf and the cross-section of a chloroplast. So photosynthesis and overview, obviously you need to know this equation, you should have it memorized. It's basically the equation for respiration backwards, but it's not, it's not just the process in reverse. Um, things that one process needs, the other process produces. So in this case, photosynthesis needs carbon dioxide, it needs water, and you need sunlight, you also need chloroplast. This slide should probably have the word chloroplast uh, under the arrow. And you produce glucose and you produce oxygen. It's worth pointing out briefly, um, you know, you need six carbon dioxides because one glucose has six carbons. So you need six for the accounting to work. The process actually needs 12 waters and it produces six. So the balanced formula is just six waters on the left as a reactant. But just file away for later that you actually need 12 and you produce six. Um, a good question to ask is where does the oxygen come from that plants produce? Um, if you look at the equation and I said, you know, where do these six O2s come from? Most people would probably guess that it came from the six CO2 that you just split in half because the math works out easily. That seems pretty, you know, sensical. Well, actually that's wrong. The oxygen comes from splitting water. What plant cells do, what chloroplasts do, is they split H2O, they split water into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen just gets given off in the, in the, in the um, mesophyll of, of the leaf. So of my reactants, like those six carbons and carbon dioxide become glucose. Um, the oxygens of carbon dioxide either become the glucose or they become the oxygen and water. The hydrogens in the water that you need and rest of you need at 12, either become incorporated in the water that you produce or the glucose. But the six O2s actually come from the 12 waters that you need. And the math works out. There's 12 oxygens here. There's 12 oxygens there, right? So the math actually works out. But the oxygen that, that you're breathing right now came from water. It's kind of weird to think. It came from water molecules that plants split in photosynthesis. So in chapter seven, we met NAD and FAD. NAD and FAD were electron shuttles, which were molecules they captured high energy electrons um, to take them to the electron transport chain. Well, photosynthesis has a version of NAD called NAD P plus. The P does not stand for photosynthesis, but it's useful because it's the version that's used by plants. You can think of it as any for plants if you want to. Um, the oxidized form is NAD P plus, the reduced form is NAD pH. So if you look at the equation, we did this in chapter seven, right? In this case, CO2 is reduced to become glucose. H2O, sorry, is oxidized to become oxygen, gas. And the electrons, you know, on their way from CO2 to glucose, they're carried there by NAD P+, which again becomes NAD pH. So there's two main processes in photosynthesis. Um, this is a great slide because it kind of summarizes what, what each process needs and what it produces pretty succinctly. Um, there's the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. The light reactions, you guessed it, they require light. They happen in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. And they need, actually we'll see what they need here in just a minute. They really only need sunlight and water um, and chlorophyll. They produce oxygen gas, they produce ATP, and they produce NADPH. So the light reactions are great. You, you have to, that has to happen, but you're nowhere near making glucose yet. You're making the things that you need to make glucose. The Calvin cycle happens in the stroma, that fluid surrounding the thylakoid membranes. Um, the Calvin cycle is going to need the NAD pH that you produce in the light reactions, and you need, um, you need carbon dioxide, and you also need a little bit of ATP, and that's going to be to produce ultimately glucose. All right, so the Calvin cycle needs CO2, ATP, and NAD pH. Um, when I was in school, you know, back in the dark ages, my, or some textbooks called the Calvin cycle the dark reactions. Um, that's a bit of a misnomer because they can happen during the day. They don't, they don't need light, so they can happen at night. 
but they're still happening during the day. So calling the Calvin cycle the dark reactions is a, is a misnomer. But if you see that in a different textbook, it's just an old term for the Calvin cycle. Some books call it the Calvin Vincent cycle. It's, it's all the same thing. Okay, so we need to do a quick review of um, what pigments are and what the electromagnetic spectrum is. This is something you probably did in, in chemistry or physics class, but it becomes very important in, in biology. So the thylakoid membranes in a chloroplast, you know, you're using light energy to excite electrons, which you're gonna capture in NADP+. All right? Um, color comes from the wavelengths of light that an object reflects. So right now my shirt is red. My shirt reflects red light. That's why you see it is red. There's a white light right over here. You can't see it, but it's to my side. Um, that white light's giving off all of Roy G. Biv, right? That white light's hitting my shirt. My shirt absorbs green, it absorbs blue, it absorbs purple, but it reflects red. So what you see is what's reflected. So chlorophyll um, is green, right? So chlorophyll is reflecting green light, all right? So what wavelengths does chlorophyll actually absorb? Chlorophyll absorbs, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but I wanna go ahead and go through this. Chlorophyll mostly absorbs red light and, and blue light. So there's a classic sort of middle school age science experiment where you shine different color of light bulbs on plants and see which, which light plants prefer. Green light's trash. Green, under green light, at least green plants will die because if it's reflecting all the light, it's not doing any photosynthesis, right? Red light bulbs or blue light bulbs are the best. Red's actually, I believe, better than blue because um, that's what the plant actually absorbs. So question, just to consider for a second, you know, if something reflects everything, it would be white. If objects reflect nothing, if they absorb everything, they would be black. You all know wearing a black shirt in the summer, shirt gets, re gets really hot. So why not have nature design pigments that are black? Pigments that are black absorb the entire, you know, all of Roy G. Biv. You know, if, if you can use the entire visible spectrum, why, why not? Well, what would be a disadvantage to having a pigment that absorbed all the colors that was black? Before I tell you, just think, why might it be a bad idea to have a pigment that is black? Okay. Well, the answer is, it's probably going to get too hot. All right. Um, Plants need sunlight. Plants like the light. If the pigments are black, they're going to get really, really hot during the day, and that might denature the enzymes of the chloroplast, right? So having pigments that are black probably is, is going to be too, too energetic. So having pigments that only absorb certain wavelengths is a better idea. Of course, then you're limited to what you can absorb, right? So how about have pigments of different colors? You know, xanthophyll is yellow, chlorophyll is green, keratin is orange, there's pigments that are red, pigments that are purple, you, you know, leaves change colors. So what nature has provided is a system with different colors of pigments, so as a, an individual pigment doesn't get too hot, but pigments can transfer electrons to other pigments. So you have the whole rainbow of pigments, so you're, you know, you can access all the colors or use all the colors, but not as one pigment. So it's like the best of both worlds. Um, it's worth pointing out, you know, you, you probably have done the EM spectrum from gamma rays to radio waves. Um, this is the short end. This is the long end. Um, visible light is the colors of light that your eye can detect. Um, the numbers here are in nanometers, so 380 to 750. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So take a meter stick, cut it into a billion pieces, right? Um, 500 of those, which would be very small, if that's the wavelength, your eye sees it as blue. Uh, 580 is yellow, 700 is red, 380 is purple, uh, 480 is blue, you can read the spectrum. Um, you don't need to have the numbers memorized, but just appreciate that the range that you can see, what, from 380 to 750 is, 300 between three and 400 nanometers that's that range you know 400 billionths of a meter that's more than the range um is what your eye can detect that's it if your eye could see a thousand nanometers you'd be seeing infrared if you could see one nanometer you'd be seeing ultraviolet right um and your eyes can't detect that 
So what you know, your your eyes are amazing. They can they can they can like separate out billions of nanometers. Um, or I'm sorry, billions of meters. That'd be a very small, a billionth of a nanometer. Um, and of course, your eye interprets those as different colors. Okay, so this just shows chlorophyll is green. It absorbs all the colors, reflects green. Okay, so this is showing, this is a really important diagram. This is showing um, a spectrum of light. The x-axis is wavelength. And they've, they've given you the numbers and the colors, like 700 is red. Um, and this is showing it for three different pigments, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carot carotenoids, like carotene, which are orange. And the y-axis is the absorption, how much is absorbed at, at the different wavelengths. Um, a peak means that color is absorbed a lot. A valley, or where it's you know zeroing, where it's deadlining, um, would be where it's absorbed none, which means it's reflected. So look at chlorophyll B, all right? Chlorophyll B has a big peak there and a big peak here. What does that mean? Actually, I think I said something wrong a minute ago. I think that's so, chlorophyll absorbs blue better than red. I think I said chlorophyll absorbs red better. Chlorophyll absorbs blue better. Um, it's not that big a deal. So what does chlorophyll do? And I, I, I don't love how they made the, line green they made the line green because chlorophyll is green but chlorophyll absorbs blue light big peak here and it absorbs orange to red light a smaller peak here what does chlorophyll do to green light it, it it's not absorbing it so it's reflecting it um, chlorophyll a is kind of a more of a bluish green um, it absorbs blue toward purple and it absorbs red. What's chlorophyll A do to green light? It reflects it. Carotenoids are, it's like what's in a carrot, they're orange. Um, what colors do carotenoids absorb the most? Well, they have two peaks kind of side by side in the, the, the blue headed toward green part of the spectrum. What do carotenoids do to orange light? Well, the line is so low, it like, doesn't have a line. It's zero. It reflects orange. So a graph like this, like kids misinterpret these. The peak is what is absorbed. So to figure out what color something is, you have to see what is not absorbed, which means it's likely reflected. The light could be going through the pigment. It could be being transmitted, but that really isn't the case here. It's either reflected or it's, or it's absorbed, okay? Um, this just shows the rate of photosynthesis measured by O2 release. Um, it's called an action spectrum of, of all the colors. Um, what colors give me the most photosynthesis? Excuse me. Um, blue does and red does. Green is trash. Green light doesn't help the plant hardly at all. Okay. All right, so let's go through the light reactions briefly. So chlorophyll A is the main photosynthetic pigment that plants use. Chlorophyll B, uh, other pigments, capture the sun's energy and transfer it to chlorophyll A. Um, if you look at a molecule of chlorophyll A, this is nothing you need to memorize. It's worth noting there's a metal, there's an atom of magnesium in the middle. Um, plants need trace amounts of magnesium because chlorophyll A is centered around magnesium. Um, okay, cool. So in general, what the light reactions do, so this diagram, um, shows, I need that bar to go away, shows sunlight, a photon of light from the sun hitting chlorophyll. That electron gets excited, it absorbs the light, and then it's gonna eventually fall back down, you know, it gets excited to a higher orbital, and it eventually gives off that energy. It's either heat or it could be light if it's, if it's glowing, all right? So the electron gets excited, and then goes back down to the ground state. If, if this is all that I've done, if I haven't captured the electron or put it to use, you know, you, you didn't really do anything great, big whoop, big deal. What I want to be able to do is, is do something with this electron, either capture it or during its journey back down, um, go through an electron transport chain to produce energy, to produce ATP. So this is the, the general gist of what's going on, but I want to capture that electron when it's in the higher um, energy state. Um, this is what I just said. This is just a more complicated picture. So a photon of light hits chlorophyll, it gets transferred between the different whatever's in the chlorophyll molecule. 
eventually it gets to the, the reaction center, it gets excited. Um, and then again, I wanna capture the electron and use it to, to do something. Um, there's two different what are called photosystems. We'll see these more in, in just a second. A photosystem just involves the reaction center where the electron is surrounded by the other, other pigments that can absorb light from the sun and transfer it to the reaction center. Don't let this diagram confuse you. Usually diagrams like this, well, this, is, this isn't really less confusing, is it? But this diagram is more important to understand than is this diagram, okay? All right, cool. So there's two types of photosystems. There's photosystem one and photosystem two. Um, photosystem two actually happens first, but it was discovered second. Um, that's not, not, not that big a deal. Photosystem one absorbs 700 nanometers best, two absorbs 680, those are both um, red light. Remember, plants love red light. So let's look at this diagram. Let's go through this in terms of this picture. Um, the AP exam would not expect you to be able to draw this or to have this memorized. They would give it to you and ask you questions about it. So let's talk about this. This is called linear electron flow. So let's just trace an electron from the beginning to the end and see what happens. So here I have a uh, photosystem um, two. Photosystem two happens first, but it was discovered second, which is why it's called photosystem two. And light comes in, hits the pigments, gets transferred to chlorophyll, that electron gets excited, all right? Um, it could just go back down, but that's not what it's gonna do. It's gonna go through an electron transport chain. We discussed this in chapter seven. It's the same type of thing where you transfer the electron from between cytochromes um, and you produce ATP right now when the electron goes back down to its lower ground state lower lower energy state it doesn't go back to the original chlorophyll it goes to photosystem one um, here then this electron can get excited again by light a second time it gets captured by nad p plus to form nad ph okay so if i'm one electron i'm sitting here i get excited go through the electron transport chain go to this, this reaction center, get excited again, and get captured by NAD P plus, okay? Now, so that was one electron. Do I just do it with one? Well, no, you repeat it. So when, when this electron gets captured, there's a big gaping hole, a figurative hole, where the electron was. Well, how, how do I replace that hole? Well, back in photosystem two, there's always another electron coming as long as it's, it's daytime. So to replace this electron, you replace it with one from photosystem two. Now, how do I place the one that I lost in photosystem two? Well, that's where the splitting of water comes in. This notation looks pretty complicated. Um, just understand that the plant, the chlorophyll takes a, a, actually it's two molecules of water, don't worry about that. It splits them. The electrons go to the reaction center to replace the ones that got excited earlier. The H plus is just, kicked off, don't worry about it. <laughs> the, pl the plant does something else a little later, but now we don't care. And the, uh, the oxygen gets released as oxygen gas, okay? So if you can't split water, you can't replace the electrons that are lost, basically you do this once and, and you know, life on earth didn't last very long because you did it once and you were done, all right? Um, and just, just appreciate this for a second, because this means the oxygen that you're breathing in right now came from a water molecule in photosystem two that the, that the plant the chloroplast split. So, the, you know, animal life exists because plants can split water in linear electron flow um, to provide electrons for this process. If this wasn't happening, you wouldn't have animal life because all animal life requires oxygen, okay? But the plant is just a waste product, but we obviously need it to do respiration, you know, back in chapter seven, okay? So again, this diagram, this looks pretty complicated, don't memorize it, although if you memorize it, you know, if you memorize something, you likely know it pretty well, um, but be able to understand it backwards and forwards. So these next, this slide and, and these next couple slides, I'm just gonna scroll through them quickly. This basically just reviews what I said in words. If you, if you need to write this down, you can just pause it. Um, first three steps, um, this is just the same diagram showing photosystem two. The next two steps, um, you know, I said it gave off those electrons, those, those protons. It uses the protons in, you know, the whole proton gradient deal with the electron transport chain, the proton motive force. That's why you need the protons. Um, and again, here's the, the whole thing again. I went through that pretty fast. So here's the first three steps. If you need to pause it, pause it. 
here's the next two steps. And then here's step six, okay? Okay, cool. And uh, here's seven and eight, sorry, there's eight steps. So long story short, what I've done is I've used sunlight, I needed chloroplast, I needed water, and I produced oxygen, I produced some ATP, and I produced some NADPH, okay? Can this happen at nighttime? No, because you need sunlight. Um, the analogy the book uses, this is a clever diagram where you're, you're you know, the, the workers with hammers are, you know, this is a photon of light. You excite the electron, put it through a mill to make ATP, um, excite it again, and then capture it. All right. Um, what this doesn't show is how, how you replace the initial one. And so you would replace it with splitting water. Okay, summary, we, we've already gone through this. Reduces ATP, NADPH, oxygen, needs water, light, chlorophyll, and all this happens inside the thylakoid membranes in the grana, those stacks inside chloroplast. So one sort of distinction, that it's, this is a minor point, but it's worth pointing out, is both the chloroplast and the mitochondria in chapter seven do the electron transport chain. The whole deal with oxidative phosphorylation, chemiosmosis, the proton motor force, ATP synthase, all that whole saga from chapter seven. Chapter eight does it too. And we don't need to go through it again um, because we went through it in chapter seven. But there's a difference in the spatial organization. And this picture, um, this slide I'll, I'll put back, this picture shows it the, the best, I think. So do you remember in chapter seven, um, the electron transport chain pumped electrons, I'm sorry, pumped protons from the matrix to the inner membrane space. Look where I'm pointing. They pump it from the matrix to the inner membrane space. And in our key here, the light gray is lower H plus, the dark gray is higher H plus. So this, this shows you're pumping um, protons from the matrix, the light gray, to the inner membrane space, the dark gray. All right. So they are in, you pump them out. The chloroplast is reversed. It's like the membrane's actually backwards. ATP synthase points the other way. Here, the, the protons are in the stroma, and you pump them inside the thylakoid membranes, and they diffuse back out through ATP synthase. Again, it's like the membrane's backwards. So here, a ATP synthase, um, the protons diffuse out. Here, they diffuse back in. So the spatial organization is backwards between them. Um, a, a classic kind of question the AP exam asks you. So obviously, you know, higher H plus, that means a base. Lower H plus, well, I said that wrong. Woo, back up. Higher H plus means an acid. Lower H plus means it's basic. All right. What would happen? Listen to my words very carefully. What would happen in, in a mitochondria? To the, to the production rate of ATP, what would happen to the production rate of ATP if I raised the pH of the inner membrane space? Okay, if I raised the pH of the inner membrane space, that's where I'm pointing, if I raise the pH here, what would happen to the production of ATP? The answer is it would go down, all right? Raising the pH means making it more basic, right? This process and pumping the protons into the inner membrane space makes it more acidic, all right? So that would, that would sabotage your production of ATP. Now, conversely, let's say I have a chloroplast and let's say it's nighttime, so there's no light reactions. If there's no light reactions, you're not making ATP, right? Well, what if I could artificially decrease the pH of the inner membrane space. If I decrease the pH of the inner membrane space, you're gonna, you're gonna jumpstart the electron transport chain and you're gonna make ATP, all right? So what you want to make ATP is to have a lower pH in the inner membrane space and a higher pH in the matrix. And here it's reversed. Here you'd wanna have um, a lower pH, have it more acidic in the thylakoids, and have it more basic in the stroma, okay? Did I say that right? Yeah, you want to have it more acidic in the thylakoids, more basic in the stroma, all right? If that didn't make sense, go back two minutes in the video and listen to that again, because those concepts are very important to, to understand. 
This just reviews, we've done half of this process so far. We've done the light reactions. Um, the ATP, the NADPH is gonna go into the Calvin cycle, which will give off the NADP plus and ADP to go back to the light reactions um, to repeat the cycle there. So this just shows sort of a review of the light reactions via the electron transport chain. You can see how the process pumps um, hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space. And when they diffuse out down their concentration gradient, you make ATP. Okay, so the Calvin cycle. There isn't a whole lot actually we're gonna say about the Calvin cycle. Um, the things that it needs are ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. It also needs carbon dioxide and it takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast. Um, the main molecule that leaves is a, it's actually not glucose. It's a three carbon sugar named glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or just nicknamed G3P. Um, just note that it has three carbons. Glucose has six. Uh, and again, here's where we are in the cycle. So here we have the Calvin cycle, and I'm sure at some point, maybe someone maybe memorized the Calvin cycle. Um, you don't need to have the whole thing memorized. What you do need to be able to do is if the AP exam gave you this diagram, and asked you questions about it, you should be able to, to interpret it um, backwards and forwards. There are some things on this diagram that you do need to know, so let's, let's go through this. So one thing to note is what you're putting into the Calvin cycle is actually three molecules of carbon dioxide, all right? So the way that it's shown here, you know, you're putting in three CO2s. Um, so it's kind of showing three turns of the cycle to get one molecule called G3P. Um, G3P is sort of like a good, a good currency that the cell likes to have on hand. It will later turn G3P into glucose or other organic sugars. Um, just note that the cycle doesn't directly produce glucose. It produces molecules of G3P, which again have three carbon atoms. Um, another, another thing to notice is the, the enzyme, this enzyme Rubisco. Rubisco is the enzyme that does what is called carbon fixation. Um, Rubisco will take the carbon dioxide and bind it to a molecule of RUBP. Notice RUBP has five carbons. We're going to bring in one carbon dioxide per turn to get this three carbon molecule, which will later break down into two. I think I said that wrong you get this six carbon molecule that you'll later break down into two three carbon molecules called three phosphoglycerate. So these five carbons bind with one CO2 to get the six carbon molecule that breaks down into two three carbon molecules, okay? Um, Rubisco, fun fact, last I checked, Rubisco was the most abundant protein on the planet because pretty much any plant has Rubisco. And Rubisco is what does carbon fixation, what takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, or out of the, the mesophyll of a leaf, and eventually turns it into a carbohydrate. Um, if Rubisco disappeared, what molecule would accumulate? You'd get lots of RUBP, because you know if I took this out, you'd have a block right there. What molecule would go down? What, it would all go down after Rubisco, but 3-phosphoglycerate would be the first that would, would go down. Notice I need some ATP, I need some NADPH, we've already said that. Um, it's also worth noting here I have six G3Ps, five of them are needed to continue the cycle and only one of them actually leaves to become glucose later. And you take those to regenerate RUBP, which again repeats the cycle, okay? So don't, don't memorize this diagram, although you, you, know, you need to know what Rubisco does, you need to know what G3P is, you need to understand how I have to regenerate RUBP, um, but you, you, know, you would have a diagram on the AP exam to interpret. Um, things to note, you don't need light. It takes three turns to make one G3P, you turn that into glucose later, and the enzyme that fixes carbon is called Rubisco. We've already said all that, right? So one serious problem, this is like a serious design flaw of the molecule Rubisco. So photorespiration, so what molecules fit in the active site of Rubisco? Let's go back. RUBP fits and carbon dioxide fits, right? Simple as that. Well, guess what also fits? Oxygen will also fit in the active site of Rubisco. It's like the, the arch nemesis of CO2, O2, they both compete for the active site. That's like a serious problem because if, if a day is really, really hot and really, really dry and the plant's losing too much water, it'll close the stomata during the day. Um, 
which if that happens, your O2 levels are building up because you can't get rid of the O2. Your rubisco becomes saturated with oxygen. You can't fix CO2. The Calvin cycle stops. And this, this is a problem. It's a, it's a wasteful process. It's not something that we want to have happen. And it happens in what are called C3 plants. C3 plants, do you remember how when you fix carbon dioxide, you form this molecule called 3 phosphoglycerate uh, has three carbons. C3 plants form um, that three carbon molecule at the beginning of the Calvin cycle. Okay, so this is a problem. So at this point, you know, nature could sort of do one of two things. So I have a system with Rubisco that, that works. It works more than it doesn't, but it has a problem. Um, I could either just go back to the drawing board and scratch Rubisco and somehow evolve a new enzyme to do that. Evolution doesn't work that way. What evolution does, and this is getting ahead of ourselves, but this is a good time to introduce evolution. What evolution does is it works with what already exists and tries to make it better. It tries to make it fitter, all right? Um, if my, uh, my operating system on my iPhone has glitches, what, what does Apple do? It sends you an update. It sends you a patch. It doesn't create a new operating system from scratch, right? Because that's, that's just not what happens. You always try to upgrade what you already have. And evolution takes what already exists and tries to find ways of making it better. So I'm going to stick with Rubisco. I'm just going to find ways. And this makes life really, really complicated. You know, if you looked at my iOS on my phone, I don't know what an iOS, how you make those, but I'm sure it's like much more complicated than the very first iOS on the first iPhones because you had to have all these patches and fixes. It makes life very complicated, but that's how evolution works. It just tries to make what you have better. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a couple solutions for photorespiration. One is to have what are called C4 plants. What C4 plants do is they add an extra step, they add an extra enzyme before Rubisco that fixes the carbon dioxide into a four carbon compound that doesn't that, that oxygen doesn't compete with CO2 for the active site. Um, you do this in cells called, in, in, in the mesophyll where you have CO2, you fix your CO2 into the, these four carbon molecules, and then those molecules go into what's called a bundle sheath cell, and they release the CO2, all right? And the idea here is in your, in your bundle sheath cells, there's less oxygen. Just trust me, there's less oxygen in bundle sheath cells. So, you know, I still have Rubisco right here, but if there's less oxygen, I mean, you know, all my oxygen's in, a, in the mesophyll. Then you've separated the problem in a, you see this as spatial separation of steps. You've separated the problem by adding an extra enzyme and moving it to a different, a different part of, of the leaf. So, you know, I didn't scratch Rubisco at all. I still use Rubisco. I'm adding a, an additional step to overcome the problem. It makes it more complicated, right? Sugarcane is an example of a plant that does this. Can plants do something sort of similar? So on a hot, dry day, you close your stomata during the day. Well, why don't you just open your stomata at nighttime? You know, plants can do that. You can have them open at nighttime, but without any sunlight, without being able to do the light reactions, you're not gonna have much Calvin cycle going on. So having your stomata open at night, you know, okay you can get the, the exchange the gases but that's not when you're doing that's not when you need the gases what can plants do is they open their stomata at night and they close them during the day which seems like a bad idea because you need the gases during the day but they fix the co2 at nighttime um, using again an additional enzyme and just just different kinds of, of organic acids um, and that happens at night which again you're not doing the light reactions at night you're fixing your ox your, your co2 at night during the daytime, these organic acids then give off the CO2. So I can, it's like a way of storing my CO2 at night and then during the daytime releasing the CO2, it's already in the leaf uh, with my stomata closed. Here I have a temporal, temporal means time, separation. You fix your organic acids at night using a different enzyme than Rubisco. During the daytime, you're using Rubisco, um, but I can have my stomata closed, and because I'm flooding it with CO2, you have lots of, you have plenty of CO2. The problem of photorespiration isn't much of a problem. Um, pineapples do um, CAM metabolism. This just, just reviews the two, okay? 
So I haven't, you know, done away with Rubisco. I just added an extra step in both cases to overcome that problem of photorespiration. This just reviews the whole thing, right? This diagram you should understand backwards and forwards. Um, and just, you know, last thing, it, it's worth noting, we began by saying nature has provided us with a way of storing the sun's energy. And we store the sun's energy as glucose. And the plant can take glucose and make it into, into long starches and cellulose and things like that. You know, plants like, um, you know, some plants like, like, like potatoes will store the excess carbs in the roots like tubers or seeds or fruits. Um, plants do all that for us. They provide us with a way of storing the sun's light or the energy from the sun's light. And of course, they also produce oxygen for our atmosphere, which is, you know, very helpful for those of us who need oxygen. Okay, that's enough for that video. Hope that was helpful. I will see you guys next time.